Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, a blessed good morning to everyone. You know, we just witnessed and experienced a tremendous partnership between the Holy Spirit and the praise and worship group. Let's just give God thanks for that partnership again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. You know, the Bible says that the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are saved. They are saved. Amen. Every time they are saved. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, today, I want to share with you from the topic, Guidelines for a King. Guidelines for a King. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word, your rhema word, your life-giving word, your life transforming word, your word that can change any situation, your miraculous word, O oh God. And Lord, we just pray that, Lord, as your word is presented, O oh God, that you will lead, that you will guide, that you will anoint me and your word, O oh God. Cause your kingdom to come. Cause your will to be done, Lord God. Hallelujah. Glorify your name, O oh God. Glorify your name. Thank you for, for manifesting your awesome presence. Thank you for enabling us to worship you, Lord. To worship you and to magnify you, Lord. And Lord, we just want to thank you for your word now. Open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Cause them to be enlightened even more, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just renounce every hindrance to listening to your word now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that you will continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Now, there are, perhaps there are more, but I want to identify two types of Bible study. The scribes and the Pharisees, they studied the Bible. They, they knew the, the Bible that they had then. They knew every letter, but they did not apply the word. They did not believe everything that was in the word. They did not understand everything that was in the word. So th that's a form of Bible study, you know, where you just, you just study and you gain knowledge and you don't apply the knowledge. And sadly, Many, many churchgoers, that's the type of Bible study they like. They, they like to, you know, study the word, look at the Greek, look at the Hebrew, do memory verses, but they don't apply the word to their lives. And then, there's a type of Bible study that Jesus did, and, and that's in the context of discipleship. Now, Jesus taught his disciples, but why did he teach them? He taught them to prepare them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's why he taught them. He didn't just give them, you know, Bible, Bible verses and, and teach them so that they could feel puffed up. That's why the Bible says, knowledge puffeth up. You know, when you when you 
Rate yourself based on how much you know and think you are better than others because you know more than they do. That is knowledge that puff it up. But, but the type of Bible study that God wants for us is Bible study that we, we, we study the word and we apply the word. We apply the word. And I, I love, I love application. I love application. Praise God. I, I love to, you know, I, I was a research scientist before I came into full-time ministry. For 15 years, I was a research scientist. And the thing I loved about, um, you know, I did pure science and I did applied science. And to me, apply pure science is not full of, the, the, imp, the, the information is important. But unless it is applied, I don't get excited. I don't get excited unless it is applied. I loved to apply science to life. So, you know, I, I love to research the Bible. I love to research the Bible. I, I, li I, li I like to look at the promises of God. But, but I, I like to put the promises of God to the test. If it is a promise, it is supposed to be real. It is supposed to be applicable to life. And I like to, to, to take God at his promises and put him to the test. You know, God says in Malachi, prove me. He says, prove me. When he spoke about tithe, tithing and giving offerings, he said, prove me. I believe in those days, you know, people were finding it very difficult to tithe and to give offering. And they felt that, you know, the money is so small, the money can do so little, how can I tithe? But God is saying, prove me. Prove me. Praise God. Amen? Praise God. So, today, I, I want to just, as I said, I want to look at it. Look at the, the, this topic, guidelines for a king. For a king. You, you might say, Pastor, we are not kings. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm going to show you that as long as you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a king. Amen? You are a king. You know, some of us, we are walking around as if we are nothing. Some of us, we are walking around as if God doesn't love us, God doesn't care for us. When God has made you a king, he has made you a king. Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God. That's the first point I want to make. In Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, the Word of God says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. I love that. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood. Remember that. In his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Amen. So the first thing he did was to wash us from our sins in his own blood. Not cow blood, not sheep blood. Not goat blood, not bird blood, but his own blood. Very important. And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Hallelujah. It says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, 
what we see from the text here is that God has made us kings. Now, whether you're a woman or you're a man, God has made you a king. Amen? And Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God. As kings, and look at this, as kings we answer to Jesus, who is the king of kings. He's the supreme king. And we are the under, under kings. We are below him. We serve as kings. And Jesus is Lord, supreme Lord of lords. Praise God. We are seated together with him in heavenly places. In other words, he's seated on his throne at the right hand of God. And positionally, from a spiritual point of view, we are seated together with Jesus in heavenly places. So we are reigning with him to a certain extent now. Amen? We are reigning with him to a certain extent now. Now what that means is that all the principalities and all the powers, all the rulers of the darkness of this world and all the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places is below us. We are above them in God's scheme of things. Amen? We are over them. And that is why Jesus is able to say to us, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over every power of the enemy. And he said, Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why, can we, why is it that we can tread upon serpents and upon scorpions? Because they are below us. They are below us positionally. Amen? So we can tread. We can tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over every power of the enemy as priests. So we are kings and we are priests. Amen? This evening we are we're, we're going into the community to pray and to praise God. Amen? And, and let me say this. We are going as kings. We are going as kings. We are going as persons who have authority and power from Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. We are going as persons who have authority and power from Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we are also going as priests. As priests. Hallelujah. As priests. We are to present sacrifices of praise and worship to him. And that's what we just did in praise and worship. You, you all performed a wonderful priestly ministry during the service of worship. It was awesome. I heard people clapping. I heard people praising God. I heard people shouting unto God. And I said, praise God. That's a priestly ministry. We are called to be priests. And priests worship God. Priests praise God. And priests, priests pray. They supplicate. And they intercede. That's a priestly ministry. And it's very, very important. Amen? We are to pray, supplicate, intercede on his behalf. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17, verses 4 to 20. Now, we passed this in our Bible reading um, several weeks ago. And, uh, you know, it really touched my heart. And, and I was waiting on God, if God would have me to share on this. And, and so I have the release this morning. It says, Deuteronomy 17, and, and, it's, and it's entitled in my Bible, Guidelines for a King. That's us. That's us. Amen? Yes, it was, it was speaking about both, both um, physical and spiritual kings. Same principles apply. Amen? So, he says, 
you are about to enter into the land the Lord your God is giving you. You are about to enter into the land the Lord your God is giving you. You know, you know, you know what I found in, in life as a Christian? That God is not a boring God. He's not a boring God. He's not a God that, that, that lacks new ideas. In fact, his purposes for each and every one of us lives have been laid out for, for all eternity. His purposes for our lives. Amen? And what I've found is that at, at, at various seasons in my life, God has a new phase for my life. He has a new phase for, our, for, our, for, our, for, for my life and for your life. And, and with this church, um, we are about to enter an era of the land, so to speak, that we have never entered before. And, 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 and I believe that in your lives, there is, there is a new land. There is a new frontier that God has for each and every one of us. Every one of us. We, we must never get into a mode where we said, well, that's it. There is no more for my life in God. We must never get into that mode. Hallelujah. You know, I was try I'm trying to remember the words of, of, of um, one of the prophecies, but it, it really fits. There's a line from it that really fits what I just said. Don't, don't forever one moment resign yourself to believe that you have seen everything that you need to see and there is no more that God has for you. That's not true. That's not true. Amen? I found that, that each layer is a, is a step to the next layer. Praise God. And you must look at life like that. Praise God. And so, you know, the, the Bible says that um, eyes have not seen. Eyes have not seen. You see, they were, they were getting ready to enter the land, but their eyes had never seen the land. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things God have in store for them. Praise God. Beloved, if you don't get anything else, please embrace this. God has a good plan for your life. Amen? And you must live, live your life with expectation. Live your life with expectation. Live your life believing that God is with you and that God has a wonderful plan and purpose for your life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So he says, you are about to enter into the land. I love that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I am excited about life because I sense that I'm about to enter the land. And I'm saying that you are about to enter the land. And, and listen, I'm not just talking about church. It can be with respect to your family. It can be with respect to with your, your job. It can be with respect to your children. But God has a plan. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Each day, God has new things in store for us. 
Christianity is not boring. It's very exciting. Take it from me. I have been there and I have done that. I have been there and I have done that. If I, have told, if I were to tell you some of the things that I did, you would faint. I've been there and done that. And I'm telling you that there is nothing more exciting than serving Jesus Christ. There is more to serving Jesus Christ than just coming to church and singing choruses and read your Bible and clap your hand and go back home. Those things help you to access what God has for you. But they are not it, so to speak. Amen? And this is what guidelines for a king is talking about. How to access the things that God has for us. Hallelujah. He wants, he has, he has new challenges and new frontiers. He wants us to pursue. He wants us to go from glory to glory. Listen, man. Christianity is not static, you know. You get baptized, you dry off, and you sing, I've been to the river and I've been baptized. And that's it. He wants us to go from glory to glory. And when you reach glory, there is an ex from glory to glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. However, our ability to access what God has for us is dependent on our obedience to his word. Amen? Let's get back to the scripture. He says, when you take it over and settle there, he says, you may think. Can you imagine that? God is going to lead them by his spirit into the promised land. And he's saying, when you get into the promised land, instead of being led by me, you might begin to think out your future. You may begin to think what you can do for yourself without God's help and God's guidance. That's what he was saying. You may begin to think but you know, God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Amen? Your ways are not my ways. Amen? He said, he said, you may think we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You know, as I read this, I said, you know, Moses was really connected to God, you know. He was really a prophet. You know what he was? He was seeing in the future that one day they would reject Samuel and ask for a king. And in rejecting Samuel, they were rejecting God. And that they would ask for a king. And so Moses in, in, he was seen in the future by the Holy Spirit. He said, if this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. Now, I love, I love Mo, uh, Moses' spirit and his attitude as a prophet. He didn't say, thus said the Lord, it's going to happen that you're going uh, to choose a king. He said, if it happens. Amen? In other words, there's a time for humility as we practice the, form, the, the, the prophetic. There's a, there's a place for humility. Amen? He says, you must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. 
The Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself. Talking about guidelines for a king. Amen? Because they will turn his heart away from the Lord and he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. In other words, he was saying that all these things have the potential of turning a king's heart from the Lord. Amen? And may I say, these things also have the potential of turning our hearts from God. Amen? So, listen to this. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 to chapter 11 and verse 2. Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. What did the word say? The king should not do that. Amen? Solomon, who was supposed to be the wisest man, Solomon who, when God came to him and said, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. Solomon said, I want wisdom. He didn't ask for riches. But later on in life, as he came into the land, the purpose that God had for him, his heart became polluted. So it says, Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. He, he had so many, he had to build cities for them. Cities for horses, cities for chariots. But it was against the word of God. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone. And valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt. That again was again against God's word. And from Cilicia. The king's traders acquired them from Cilicia at the standard price. At that time, chariots from Egypt could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver and horses for 150 pieces of silver. And he had silver as plentiful as Jerusalem stones. They were then exported to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. And then in, in 1 Kings 11 and verses 1 and 2, hear what it says. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. That was forbidden. That was forbidden. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel. He had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. So they are gods. And then hear what it says. It says, yet Solomon insisted. Let me say that again. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. 